Welcome uh, to everyone. Today's lecture is um, uh, cardiovascular and uh, telemetry. I know a lot of you um, are going to be going over this in some of your um, in some of the lectures and parts of your program online. So I wanted to give you some uh, coverage on this. What I have here is the PDF that most of you should have if you're in the EKG or telemetry course. Um, and this I believe is also um, under your medical assistant as well, uh, but it's broken up into um, different uh, modules. So we're gonna start uh, off the discussion today with actually learning how to take apart a, a rhythm strip. Now, as medical assistants um, and some of my online students might be an EKG, taking apart uh, an actual strip is not part of an EKG um, technician's job description, okay? So you won't be reading 12 leads like we have right here. Okay, this is not something that you're going to do. Uh, if you are a telemetry technician, what you will be doing is actually reading what we call six second strips. And I'm gonna take you to that right now. We'll probably have another lecture where we go over the actual um, EKG leads and lead placement. That is um, pretty in depth, uh, not real easy, but I'd like to schedule a lecture for that. So we're gonna just bypass some of this right now. And uh, we're gonna start here. And I know this is kind of difficult to see, but uh, what, we're, what you'll be looking at if you're working in telemetry or a, cardiovasc a cardiologist's office, he'll be, he might be doing some telemetry. Um, definitely if someone's on a treadmill, if we're doing a stress test, it, it just depends um, what, type of test you'll be running. Uh, usually people that are on telemetry are in hospitals and they have telemetry technicians monitoring, um, monitoring their, uh, their heart rate on telemetry monitors. And we'll try to take a look at some of those um, live rhythms uh, before the end of lecture today. So the first thing that you need to do is understand how to, um, how to read the grid. Okay, this just looks like graph paper, and it is. It's just basic graph paper. But if you take a look in the corner here, um, if you take a look in the uh, in the corner over here, you'll see that we have a um, a box. This is called a large box, and each of the large boxes are composed of five small boxes. So, for instance. Um, each of these small boxes going in the horizontal or X axis, each distance is 0 0.04 seconds. The Y axis is divided into uh, millivolts and each box in the Y direction is 0.5. So if I had two boxes stacked on top of each other, then the total amount of millivolts would be one millivolt, right? Or consequently, Conversely, if I had two large boxes stacked next to each other, the horizontal direction would be 0 0.40 seconds. All right. So we are going to learn how to calculate a heart rhythm based upon the strip that we see. And I like to use the 1500 rule, counting the R peaks in a six second strip don't always give you an accurate heart rate because especially if you pull the strip too soon or if you pull it too late, it's not gonna be an actual six second strip, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at, we're gonna go through briefly um, the chambers of the heart and just kind of review our cardiovascular anatomy. If you were with us in the previous lectures, I did a pretty in-depth lecture on this. But just to kind of uh, review a little bit, let's take a look at some of the vessels of the heart, okay? So here we're looking at the heart. 
Uh, we're looking at an anterior view. This is the heart apex where you'll hear the heart rate the loudest. These are your uh, atria. Here's your right atria, your left atria. This is your inferior vena cava. This is um, your superior vena cava where your deoxygenated blood runs into the right atrium, right? And from the right atrium, we go into the uh, right ventricle through the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve. Uh, once the blood is in the um, right uh, ventricle, it's the blood is going to be shunted uh, through the pulmonic semilunar valve into the pulmonary artery, which is um, the right and left pulmonary artery, which will go to the lungs. And there on the surface of the pulmonary alveoli, the blood will become oxygen, oxygenated as we um, inhale uh, freshly inspired air. And that freshly oxygenated blood is going to come back into the heart through the right and left uh, pulmonary arteries. Okay, And once inside um, the pulmonary arteries, it empties into the left atria, which goes through the bicuspid or mitral valve or the left atrioventricular valve into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it goes through the pulmonic, uh, I'm sorry, from the aortic semilunar valve up and out through the aortic arch um, to your right and left, um, well, through your um, brachiocephalic trunk and your right and left carotids. Okay, so a little brief review. This is the fat around the heart. And inside each of the, the fat, we have these sulci where your coronary arteries and veins run. Now remember, something really important is that the heart muscle has to rest in between a heartbeat so that the heart muscle can be perfused with fresh, freshly oxygenated blood, right? Because the heart muscle has to um, be nourished for it to be able to beat. Okay, so this is just what I re uh, reviewed, the blood flow to the heart, okay? And here is a slice uh, of inside of the heart where you can actually see the different chambers. Now we're gonna be paying close attention to a lot of these um, fibers and nodes because these fibers and nodes are going to be very important because these are gonna be generating the actual, um, the actual heartbeat, okay? So if we take a look, um, I'm sorry, if we take a look at the, um, at the heart right now, you'll see that in the upper right atria, right clo close to where the um, superior uh, vena cava uh, empties into the right atria, we have what we call the SA node. Now the SA node is your pacemaker of the heart. That, that's another name that it goes by because it's able to beat the heart between 60 and 100 beats per minute, which we all know is the normal uh, heart rate. So if you take either a radial pulse or an apical pulse, you are going to be able to detect the heart rate, right? So if we have a heart rate between 60 and 100, that's considered normal. Um, below that, right on the cusp um, between where the, um, the atria and the ventricles meet right before we go into the um, right uh, ventricle, we have the AV node or the atrioventricular node. This is the backup node of the SA node. And the AV node can beat the heart between um, uh, 40 and 60 beats per minute. Now, this, it takes time to go from the SA to the AV, right? There's an electrical current that's going to be uh, disseminated between each of these nodes. From the AV node, this node is going to electrify and stimulate um, both atria, okay? Both atria are going to be stimulated. And then in the septum of the heart, we have our um, bundle of his, or they've they say the his bundle. And the his bundle can be between 20 and 40 beats per minute. And from the his bundle of his, 
uh, we are going to go through different bundled branches on either side of the heart. And this is all taking place in the myocardium, right? The myocardium is what the middle layer of the heart because we have our, our uh, pericardial sac with our pericardial fluid and we have our visceral pericardia. And then we have the um, epicardium and we have our myocardium, and we have our endocardium, which is the tissue inside of the heart. So the Purkinje fibers disseminate all of the electrical activity to the heart and it comes back to the SA node. So we're gonna talk about depolarization and repolarization in between every beat to give you an idea of what the heart muscle has to go through to be able to um, successfully complete one, uh, one cycle. You'll notice too, uh, these beautiful cords that we have here. These are your chordae tendinae. And um, the chordae tendinae um, uh, are attached to the uh, papillar muscles and the, um, uh, the, the, the base of the heart is filled with um, uh, trabeculae. So it's a, a very thick muscle. And you'll notice this, not so much in this drawing, but maybe in another one, you're going to see that the left ventricle is extremely thicker in the myocardium than the right. And that is so that that final push that the left ventricle has to exert to push all the blood, well, not all the blood, there's still about 50 uh, mLs inside of the uh, inside of the left ventricle, usually at all times, but it's ready, it's gotta give that final push up and out through the aortic uh, semi-lunar uh, valve to the aortic arch, okay? And normally, if someone has a, um, a genetic predisposition, like if they have a, a, an inherited chromosomal defect, such as Marfan syndrome, you'll see that some people have a, a weak intima of their aorta and that can cause bulging and uh, it can cause what we call an aortic dissection, which is, uh, you know, cannot, is not compatible with life. So, you know, the heart has uh, several uh, characteristics that are really important. Um, the characteristics of the heart include its, able to, its ability to beat uh, so it's automatic, it has automaticity. Part of the autonomic nervous system as, a, uh, as, uh, as opposed to our um, somatic nervous system where we control our hands and our feet. You know, the heart has automaticity. So we're thankful for that. It has conductivity where it can conduct electrical impulses. It has contractility. It has rhythmicity and excitability. So the heart has all these different properties. It, it's really similar to your um, striated uh, muscle that you have um, in, our, in our bones, except the heart muscle, the muscle is, um, is not as striated. It has bifurcations. And if I uh, have phlebotomists here, you'll know what we mean by a bifurcating vein, right? Where it's kind of like a tributary, you're going straight and all of a sudden it branches off, you go right, you go left. The heart muscle has bifurcated um, uh, muscle cells. And the whole purpose of bifurcated muscle cells is so that the heart, the electricity of the heart can be disseminated throughout the entire muscle. So it works really, um, it's a pretty cool um, uh, design. And uh, We'll, we'll might get into that in a little bit. But what I'd like to show you is this is the electrical, cond electrical conductivity of one heartbeat. So that lub dub, lub dub. This is what this is. This is the lub dub. And we're going to take it apart a little bit to help you understand the lub dub. This is a lot easier to see than the, um, um, than the other um, uh, picture that we had. But you can see the large boxes here, right? You can see all the large boxes. You can see the five small boxes. So it's a lot easier to count. So for instance, here's um, our one large box, right? So if we take one large box and we go from point A to point B, 
I've gone five small boxes, right? And because each small box is 0 0.04 uh, seconds, then if I go from here to here, I've gone 0 0.2 seconds. Again, um, going upward, we have each is 0 0.01 millivolt and two boxes in the vertical direction is one millivolt. All right, so now let's take a look at some of these letters here. We have a P, we have a Q, we have an R, we have an S, and we have a T. Very important. These are the guys that you are going to be measuring. This is what we call telemetry, cardiac monitor interpretation. So the heartbeat begins with a P wave. So we always have electrical before mechanical. So when the SA node initiates the first beat, the heart becomes depolarized. Depolarization means go. So whenever you think of depolarization, you want to think of um, a runner where they shoot the gun and the runners race. So depolarization means go. So the electrical uh, stimulation of the SA node is fires. And then what happens is um, once it fires, um, we get this P wave. Okay, so this is the P wave. This is the initiation of the heartbeat. Now, from the P wave, remember electricity has to be, it has to follow, like in a cord, it has to follow a pathway. So that electron is now, <clears throat> excuse me, going to go from the SA node to the, um, the AV node, which is represents our Q wave, okay? So SA to AV. So our atrioventricular node, remember where that AV node is. That AV node is sitting right at the base of the right atrium, almost into the right ventricle, but not quite. So it's in a really good position, the atrioventricular node, because what's gonna happen now is that atrioventricular node, which beats our heart between you know, 40 to 60 beats, is gonna send an electrical signal through both sides of the heart to right and left. And it's going to go to the bundle of his, which is our R. I want you to think of R now as where the electricity is going to propagate to both sides of the heart muscle, of the ventricles, right? So the bundle of his um, electrical current, uh, which is between 20 and 40 beats per minute, is going to give us our R wave. And then as the bundle of his is propagated throughout the bundle branches, okay, it's got to take, it's got to go through the whole heart. So we have this dip here, which is our S wave, which is <clears throat> basically an interval where the bundle of his is going through the right and left bundle branches. Um, and it's and it's trying to propagate through the entire myocardium, this electrical signal, so that it can go to the Purkinje fibers. Um, and finally, once it gets to all the Purkinje fibers, the Purkinje fibers are going to culminate in um, in repolarizing the heart, so that the heart becomes, um, uh, you know, it'll be in its resting state. Okay, so it'll become more negative into its, into its resting state. And then here, what we call the isoelectric line, the heart, now the heart um, arteries can reperfuse the heart and the heart muscle can rest. Okay, so the heart muscle has to rest in between beats. This is one beat. So what you're looking at here is an electrical propagation of signals that our heart gives. So if we put someone on an EKG machine and we want to look at their electrical conductivity, um, this is what we'll see. The heart generates electricity, just like our brain, just like our muscles. So if someone does what we call a uh, electroencephalogram and you put the electrodes on their, um, on their, on their head, they're going, their brain's going to generate electric, uh, electricity. If you go and have an electromyelogram where they put those little pins in your muscles, um, your muscles will generate uh, electrical current. So we're full of electricity. And that's kind of cool. 
Um, I just want to ask if everyone is with me so far. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? You can use your little box there to raise your hand. Zoom's kind of cool like that. Um, okay, so let's keep going here. So now I want to take a look before we go on. I just want to look at want to show you these intervals. These are intervals are really really important because this is what you'll be measuring. Uh, if you are a telemetry technician or possibly an EKG technician, um, each of these um, intervals are really important. So you have what we call a PR interval. Now you'll see that it's measured from the beginning of the P to the beginning of the Q. I find that a little bit um, confusing because, um, sorry, I like to have things a little bit more um, logical. So what I do is I'll draw a vertical line through the P and I'll draw a vertical line bisecting the R and I'll measure the distance between my imaginary vertical line of my P and my R and that will give me the same PR interval distance as I would here because when you look at these strips sometimes it's really hard um, to see the beginning of the P and the beginning of the Q. All right so that's how I do that. I just bisect each of these points. Um, the QRS interval is from the beginning of the Q, okay, to the end of the S, and that's usually less than three, um, uh, three boxes. Usually, it's a, it's approximately uh, small boxes. It's usually less. It's between 0 0.06 or 0 0.08 to 0 0.12. Your PR interval, you see, it's about can be about four boxes. Um, it's usually between 0 0.12, which would be three small boxes, to 0 0.20, which is actually uh, five small boxes. Um, <clears throat> and then your QT interval, which they're really, I don't think they're showing you your QT interval, is from the beginning of the Q, right, not completely to the end of the T. So if I drew a tangent line here, um, where that um, line would meet a point, on this curve, I would draw a, horse, a vertical line and that would be my QT interval. And QT intervals typically are between 0 0.34, 0 0.36 to 0 0.44, okay? And we're gonna look at this ST segment because this is really important. We're not gonna necessarily measure it, but we need to look at it because um, if it's elevated or extremely depressed, that person may be um, having some cardiac ischemia. Okay, so this is the boxes taken apart. So <clears throat> you can see this is one big box and it's 0 0.20 seconds across. And this is one small box, 0 0.04 uh, seconds across. And when you get into um, measuring, you'll always measure on a horizontal axis. So this is the beginning of a P wave, okay? So we're going from um, repolarization the heart is resting, and the SA node is going to generate a P wave. So this indicates depolarization, okay? And now the depolarization, the P wave is going to start uh, propagating. So the SA node is going to send its signal to the AV node. So if this is P, then this is our Q okay or our um, AV node and then there we're going to the bundle of his which is going to propagate to the right and left ventricles of the heart throughout the bundle branches to the S and then when we get to the S okay which is our bundle branches the bundle branches are going to propagate to the Purkinje fibers which we see here. So have we propagation to the Purkinje fibers and the heart is going to repolarize and the heart is going to rest. Okay. So here, let's take a look at a, um, a pop, approximately a six second strip here. It looks like it might be partially cut off, but that's okay. Um, let's count, first of all, let's, let's, let's think about what a normal sinus rhythm looks like, okay? And when I say sinus, what I'm actually saying is I'm saying 
a rhythm originating at the sinoatrial node. So it's a it's a an atrial rhythm. Okay. So sinus, um, a normal sinus rhythm. The first thing you want to look at is does each heart rate or each heartbeat have a P wave? So let's take a look. P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. And that's a P wave. So yes, that is a P wave for each heartbeat. Does each heartbeat have an R wave? R wave, R wave, R wave, R wave. R wave, R wave, yes, it does. Okay, well that doesn't, that's good, but it still doesn't tell us a lot until we measure everything and we, we try to get a heart rate. So with your calipers, what you would do is you would measure the distance between each of the R peaks to make sure that each of the distances are equal, or they're equal distance. You would also measure the distances between each of the P waves, P to P, P to P, to make sure those are normal. And why do we do that? Because what we're looking for is if our P waves are normal and they're equal distance apart for each heartbeat, then what we have is, a, is a, um, an atrial rhythm. Okay, so your P waves represent the atria. So we have an atrial rhythm. So we have a regularly regular rhythm. The R waves, on the other hand, represent your ventricular rhythm because this is where um, the rhythm originates, right? This is where the uh, atrioventricular node is going to communicate with the bundle of his and we are going to get a ventricular rate. So when you see a heart rate, I want you to think of two things. I want you to think of a ventricular rate and I want you to think of an atrial rate because that's going to become really important when you start to look at rhythms and you start to dissect rhythms, um, particularly when we're looking at atrial fibrillation um, or atrial flutter. The atrial rhythms can go up to 250 beats per minute and yet you're seeing a regular R to R. So you're seeing a regular ventricular rhythm but yet you're seeing an atrial rhythm that's marching way out of the, um, the ballpark with regards to how fast it's beating. Okay, now let's just take a look at some of these, um, if we can point out um, the rest of the letters here. So P, Q, R, S, T, right? P, Q, R, S, and T, P, Q, R, S, and T, P, Q, R, S, and T. So we got a P, Q, R, S, and T for each, um, e each heart rate here, which is a good thing. Um, you know, when we have another lecture on EKG and we start looking at 12 leads, um, you're gonna see that lead one is going to look a little different because you're going to say, oh my God, where are the Q? Uh, where's the Q? You know, um, and there's a reason for that because of uh, the polarity of where the leads are. Um, so we're going to take a, the, the 12 lead looks at the different, um, different views of the heart. It looks at anterior, posterior, lateral, and it helps physicians determine the axis of the heart if there's any axis deviation, which can occur in some types of cardiomegalies um, due to uh, congestive heart failure, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you know, when the heart muscle, um, you know, it, it sometimes, uh, the, the muscle, uh, the tissue is, is, is starts to become um, hyper, hyperplasic. Uh, and it, because it remodels itself. And when the heart remodels itself and maybe the left ventricle or the right ventricle gets too big, the heart starts to turn on its axis. And we can tell that in a 12 lead EKG. So I'm not gonna get too, into, too much into that. Okay, so, uh, no, you know what, let me go back. Let me go back here, because we want to, um, we want to calculate a heart, heart rate. So let's do a heart rate. Let me show you how we can calculate the heart rate on this. I do want you to pay attention to a couple of things that these R waves are not even, okay? So 
I want you guys to be like detectives, like Sherlock Holmes. I want you to think about everything that looks abnormal when you first start out in this field. Anything and anything that looks abnormal, you should start pointing out to yourself. So if these particular our peaks look, well, this is bigger than this one. And, you know, maybe this is a little lower. Um, the S is a little lower than this one. Point it out. Think about it. Um, so let's count the heart, the heart rate. The one thing I don't want you to do is this. I don't want you to use the rule that says, okay, just count the R peaks, which are one, two, three, four, five, six, and multiply it by 10, which would give you 60, which technically would be normal because 60 to 100 is a normal heart rate, but I don't want you to do that. Um, that's the easy way out and that's not gonna give you an accurate heart rate. What I want you to do instead is I want you to find an R wave that kind of sits on a solid line, like this guy right here. And I want you to count the small boxes between two consecutive R peaks, okay? So let's count the small boxes. We have five, 10, 15, almost 20, right? Almost 20. Um, and it technically it'd be closer to 19 most accurately. And if you have your calculators, which of course are your phones, I want you to take uh, 1500 and divide that by 19. And guess what? We get 78. Wow, that's a lot of difference between 60, right? <clears throat> now, the other rule of thumb is if you don't want to count the small boxes between two consecutive R peaks, you can count the large boxes. So if we were to count the large boxes between two consecutive R peaks, once again, we'd find one of the solid, um, one of the R peaks on a solid line, and we'd go one, two, three, almost four, right? Almost four, you could take four boxes then and take 300 divide that by four and you get 75. A little bit of a difference between 75, 78, but it's all normal. Whether we're 60, whether we're 78 or we're 75, but you see how much more accurate it is with the 1500 rule. Um, and let me stop here because if you're wondering where these numbers are coming from, let me assist you. So we have a six second strip. That's how every telemetry monitor or machine, when you press the button to eject the strip, it's gonna give you a six second strip. That's just the way the machines are set up. But when we calculate the heart rate, how are we calculating it? We're calculating it beats per minute, right? Not six seconds. Nobody wants to know how the heart beats in six seconds. We wanna know what is the heart rate in one minute? Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is a six second strip. So we have each of these tiny, tiny little boxes is 0 0.04 seconds, right? Now watch. If you take your calculators and you take 60 seconds and you divide it by 0 0.04, we come up with 1,500. 60 seconds is one minute, right? So what that's saying is there are 1,500 small boxes in one minute. Now, if you take a second to think about it, can you interpret why we have the 300 rule and where does 300 come from? I'll give you guys like a couple seconds to do that if you want to answer in the chat box where the 300 comes from, okay? So if there's... 1,500 small boxes in 60 seconds. And in the 300 rule, we're counting the big boxes, right? Which is the 0 0.20, I'm sorry, 0 0.2 seconds. So four, five small boxes, five small boxes. Each of these, each of these large boxes going in this direction is 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, so what would we do? How would we... Where do we come up with the 300? Have I got somebody in the chat box? All right, let's see what we have here. Um, okay. Let's see. All right, let's see. 
I let me. Um, so let's take point two zero. Okay, everyone on your calculators. Let's go ahead and take. Um, let's take three hundred. Let's take three hundred divided by point two zero. Okay, and once again, we get fifteen. We get fifteen hundred, right? Um, so we're basically looking at um, we're looking at a sixty-second heart rate. And if I take, let me see, sixty divided by no, sixty divided by point two. Oh, sorry, 60 divided by 0.2 is 300, okay? So that's where our 300 comes from. So this is how we calculate the heart rate, okay? Does anyone have any questions on how we calculate the heart rate by looking at a six second strip? Does anyone have a question? Okie doke, let's go on. Let's take a look at some heart rates here. We're gonna bypass all these medications. Some of these medications are have to be updated. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone to take a minute um, to go ahead and calculate, if you can, the heart rate on this particular rhythm strip. Okay, can we all do that? Can we all take a minute to uh, calculate this heart rate? So to help you out, I mean, none of these are peaks. None of these are peaks fall on a solid line, okay? So you're pretty much going to have to be remanded by counting the small boxes unless you can do this, the, you know, the larger boxes and then just kind of put the halves together on either side. So answer in the chat box once you come up with the heart rate. Take a minute and let's see what you get. We'll answer in the chat box. What is the heart rate? Let's see what we got. Okay, I've got 140. I've got 78. Very good. Um, let's take a look at what we have. So, I'm going to go ahead and count the small boxes once again. And I'm going to go, uh, this is about, uh, we're going to go about three. So five and five is 10 and three is 13, 14, 15. So I'm going to go with 15 small boxes. And I'm going to take, I'm going to do the 1500 rule. So 1500. And I'm divided by what did we say 15 and I'm getting 100 about 100 beats per minute let's do it this way too shall we um, let's look at let's see if we can count big boxes so this is one big box this is two big boxes we need five small squares to make the third big box and I've got one two three four five so three big boxes right so three big boxes into 300 gives me 100. So the heart rate is 100 beats per minute. Let's try that again, okay? So let's do it both ways. Let's do it the, the rule of 300 and the rule of 1500. So let's find two any two consecutive R peaks. It doesn't matter. We can choose this one. We can choose the distance between this one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go ahead and choose the distance between this one, shall we? So let's count the small boxes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We can say 14 because we're not really going to another box. This is like on it, on a on a line of the other boxes. So we're going to say 14 small boxes, okay? And we're going to take 1,500 in our computers, divided by 14. 
Well, in that case, I get 107. All right, let's do the big box. One big box, two big boxes. And we need five small boxes to equal our third small box. So we got one, two, three, four, five. That's about five. So we've got three small boxes. So 300 divided by three gives us 100. So I must have miscounted here because I was trying to show you the small boxes and I'm it kind of gets kind of crazy to look at these because they're so small. So I'm gonna go once more, I'm gonna go five, I'm gonna go 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So yeah, I'm getting 15. So 15 into 1,500 gives us 100. Does anyone have any questions on that? Because I noticed some of you had a couple different answers. Does this kind of help explain it to you? Um, go ahead and use the chat box, if you will. Does this help? Yes? No? All right. OK, great. Wonderful. Alrighty, so um, let's take a look at some more stuff here, okay? Because we've just measured heart rate, so give yourselves a gold star because actually that can be kind of confounding. So if you understand it so far, you know, you're doing amazing. Um, now let's go ahead and get some measurements here while we're looking at this strip. Um, I'm going to see if I can't find my screen calipers. These guys are kind of cool. Oh, I don't need to unlock you. I just want, I'll unlock later. Okay, here's my screen calipers. I'm going to bring these guys up. And let's go ahead and so these are screen calipers. So what I'm going to do is let's, let's look at the atrial rhythm. And let's look at the ventricular rhythm, shall we? So we're going to line up, always horizontal, from the peak of the one P to the peak of the other P, OK? Right about there. And what we're going to do is I'm going to, this should be equidistance between each of the P's, OK? So P to P, this is regular. P to P, yeah, pretty close. P to P. P to P, P to P, P to P, and P to P. So what we can say, what can we say about our atrial rhythm? It's regularly regular. So far so good, right? Our heart rate is not abnormal, it's 100. It's right on the cusp of being tachycardic because anything above 100 beats per minute is tachycardia, but it's not, so it's still considered a normal range. Now let's take a look at our ventricular rhythm, shall we? So let's line up our calipers between the R's. Oh, that's kind of beautiful. I mean, that is almost equidistance between our P's, okay? So R to R, 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 R R to R and R to R. So what can we say about our ventricular rhythm? It is regularly regular. So far, Professor so good. Professor Kimball, so, I apologize for interrupting. Um, none yeah. of us can see your calibers. I'm sorry? None of us are able oh, to see Oh, you can't calibers. see my calipers. I'm so sorry. Let me see. How do I screen share these? Um, all right, let me just do this. Sorry about that. I'm going to go ahead and um, do a new share. And now I'm going to ask if you guys can see them. I'm going to move them about. Can you see them now? If you could answer in the check box, the chat box. Oh, cool. All right. Thank you for telling me that, by the way. All right, I'm going to do it one more time. So we're going to take our calipers and we're going to line them up P to P. Okay. So P to P, peak of the P to peak of the P, right? And this is our atrial rhythm. P 
peek of pee to peek of pee. P to P, P to P, P to P, P to P, and P to P. So what can we say about our atrial rhythm? Our atrial rhythm is regularly regular. Now we're gonna do the same thing with our ventricular rhythm because remember, where's our ventricular rhythm coming from? We've got our SA node firing. It beats 60 to 100 beats per minute. That electricity goes to the AV node, which is still in the right atrium, but closer to the cusp of the right ventricle. And then it picks up the electrons, and, it, and it's going to go now to the bundle of his, which basically sits in the septal cavity that separates the um, right side of the heart from the left side of the heart. So the bundle of his is in the septum. And the elect electrons go to the bundle of his, but the bundle of his has to transport all those electrons throughout the right and left side of the heart to the bundle branches, right? And remember the bundle of his beats the heart between 20 and 40 beats per minute, where the AV node beats the heart between um, 40 and 60. So now we're going through the, the bundle branches, which are right and left. And those bundle branches are going to the Purkinje fibers which then have to propagate the electricity and go back to the SA node, but not before resting. So we have a rest here. There's always gonna be an isoelectric line where there's a rest. So now let's measure our ventricular rhythm, which is our R to R's. And you'll notice that I didn't have to do anything to the calipers, right? They're the same exact distance, which is quintessential of a normal heart rhythm, R to R. So our ventricular rhythm and our atrial rhythm both coincide with one another. So we have a regularly regular um, atrial rhythm and a regularly regular ventricular rhythm. We have a normal heart rate, which is 100. Now we have to measure the PR interval, the QRS, um, and the QT. Okay, so we have to do three interval measurements. And how do we do that? So if you'll, you're gonna wanna have a little cheat sheet with you when you go through the different rhythms, which is on this particular um, PDF file that tells you, um, that basically tells you uh, what the, the uh, intervals are. So if I go up here, and I want to measure my QRS. We said our QRS is between 0 0.08 or 0 0.06 to 0 0.12, which is a maximum of three boxes. So it's got to be between a little bit over one box and not more than three boxes. So let's see, these, kind of, these guys are kind of bulky, but let me line this up with the Q. And let me bring this in all the way. And let's see what we have here. And I'm going to line it up with a lot with a with a solid line. So can you see how many boxes are right here? One, two. Do you see that? It's two boxes. Can you tell me in the chat box if everyone can see that I have two small boxes right here? Does everyone see that? So I have two small boxes for my QRS. And I would ask you, if I have two small boxes for my QRS, is that normal? Is that a normal interval? Well, yes, because we said it could be between 0 0.06 to 0 0.12, and this is 0 0.08, so QRS is normal. So we're gonna check that off. And by the way, if you're following this, gold stars to all of you because this is not easy stuff okay um, especially when we start getting into um, some of the harder more difficult rhythms so we've got the qrs the qrs is normal now let's take a look at the pr right and how did i say i measure a pr well i said i like to measure the pr from the peak of the p to the peak of the r so basically if i took a line 
or uh, vertically and I bisected this R, it would come right down here and bisected the P. So I'm going to remove this and I'm gonna set this on a solid line so I can kind of see how many boxes I've count, I have. And this is my measurement for my PR interval. Now, how many boxes do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, four small boxes, right? Four small boxes of 0 0.04 seconds translates into what? 0 0.16, right? And we said that the PR interval can be between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20. So if I have 0 0.16, is that normal? And just put a yes or no in the chat box for me. Yeah, yeah, it fits, it's normal, right? Great, so, and you guys can see this, right? So when you are measuring, Okay, when you guys are measuring, always measure on the horizontal. You can't measure this way or this way. You got to measure on the horizontal. So we've got our QRS is normal. Our heart rate's normal. We have a regularly regular rhythm. Um, our uh, PR interval is normal. We have one last interval to measure, which is our QT. Okay, so to do the QT interval, I'm going to take, oh, that's weird, sorry. I'm going to take my calipers and I'm going to line it up Q and T. Now watch where I go. I'm not going to go to the the the, the um to where it it dips below the isoelectric line. No, I'm going to go right here. So if I took a if I took a line and I drew drew it tangently where it would intersect a point. It'd be right about, uh, maybe right about, sorry, Q, be right about here. Okay, QT. You don't want to go directly to the bottom right here where it goes Q and then it drops. It's right where it starts to drop, right before it goes to the bottom. So this would be our QT. We set our QT interval going to line this up so we can count it and um, we said our QT interval could be between 0 0.34 or 0 0.36 all the way to 0 0.44 right and in the chat box tell me what the QT interval is that you see here okay how many boxes and what is the uh, what is the interval? And uh, go ahead and answer in the chat box. Yes. Yes. Okay. I've got one answer so far. Yes. All right. I've got another one. Yes. Okay. Good job. Good job to everyone. If you said 0 0.40 seconds, bravo, you were absolutely right. Um, now we can kind of put all our puzzle pieces together, kind of like uh, being, our, being heart detectives. So what we're looking at now is uh, everything seems to fit. All of the puzzle pieces seem to point to a normal sinus rhythm, okay? Sinus coming from what? The P wave, right? So this is a normal sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. All of the measurements are working. So all of our, uh, you know, they all fall, the PR, the QT, the QRS all fall into the correct intervals. Uh, we have a regularly regular atrial rate. We have a regularly regular ventricular rate. Um, brilliant, if you guys are getting this right now, uh, can't believe we've been doing this already for 60, almost 60 minutes. Um, so how about we take a short five minute break, get some water. Uh, we'll reconvene in about five minutes and we're going to go on to uh, look at and investigate some more um, interesting rhythms that aren't normal. Okay, we'll put our Sherlock Holmes skills to work. What do you say? Let's take a short break. Okay.
Okay, uh, hopefully everybody's back. Welcome back. Hard to believe uh, an hour has already passed. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Um, I have to say that um, I particularly enjoy uh, the heart. I find it extremely interesting. I hope you all do too. All right, we're going to pass on these drugs now that you guys are like experts in um, in uh, reading a normal sinus rhythm. I would uh, ask all of you um, that have the, let me just move our calipers out of the way here. You guys can still see my calipers, right? Um, okay, great. Thank you. All righty, calipers. When you go and, um, sorry, when you go and you and you want to to do a worksheet, or you're taking a test, for some of you will be turning in tests to me, uh, the printable tests. This tells you what to do. This is how I want your exams taken apart. Okay, so. Look at the atria, look at the atrial rhythm, measure that, you know, see if it's regular. Uh, look at the ventricular rhythm. Uh, are there P waves present? Are there Q waves? Are there R waves? Um, take, take apart all of the intervals. Eventually, if you get to the, you're gonna get to the point where you're, you're gonna be able to look at a rhythm and count it without any measuring tools. Um, if this is a field that you'd like to stay in. Um, obviously, the measuring tools, the calipers are important uh, for certain types of rhythms, but for the majority of the cases, you should be able to identify it. Let's take a look at this guy. Okay. This is not normal by looking at it, right? We're going, what the world is going on here? What in the world? So let's take a look at this rhythm and... Um, see exactly what's happening here. First of all, what can we identify, right? What, what can we identify? Uh, we can see an R wave, right? We can see an R peak. But more anything other than that, we really can't discern. Because if there is a P wave, it's somewhere buried in all of this. Uh, looks like just somebody just scribbled in between each of the, the R peaks. So if there's something that we can measure, let's measure it, okay? So this, what we're measuring uh, right now is our ventricular heart rate. Now I want you to, to be, pay attention to something very carefully here. The first normal sinus rhythm that we looked at, we saw what? We saw that the, the atrial rhythm, the P waves and the R waves were synchronous they were the same distance apart. So that the heart rate that we calculated, when we calculated it between two of the R peaks, we got 100, right? And we would have got the same thing if we calculated the distance between the P waves. This is different. We can calculate a rhythm. But if we do that, what we're calculating now is a ventricular rhythm. So between R and R, R and R, R and R, R and R, R to R. What have we found out? That the ventricular rhythm, okay, is the R to R's are regularly spaced apart. But now let's count them, okay? So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to go to this particular R peak, and I'm going to line it up. This is the distance between the two R's. And can you tell me the ventricular heart rate based upon the distance between these, the, the, the spaces that I have here? Okay, you can use the 300 rule. You can use the 1500 rule. Um, take a minute to, to calculate the heart rate and give it to me in the chat box. Okay, I got an 83. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, so let's take a look at it. 
So, it, okay, got one more. Let's take a look. I got 166 from Zainab. All right, let's, let's take a look. So let's count, shall we, the small boxes first, okay? So we've got five small boxes, five small boxes, five small boxes, which is 15, right? And then we've got almost another five small boxes, which would be 20. Just shy one of that would be 19. So 19 going into, uh, let me open my calculator, 19 going into 1500, right? Divided by 19 um, gives us 78. All right, let's try the large boxes, all right? Um, let's go, let's do large boxes. One, two, three, almost four. Okay, almost four large boxes. So 300 divided by four gives us 75. So if we do the small boxes, we said 19, right? And we said 15, we're doing the rule of 1500 divided by 19 gave us 78. So the more accurate heart rate would be 78. Now here's what I want you to do. That is going to be your ventricular rate. Now this is where it, it's, go, it's going to get, you're going to say, wow, okay? Because I'm going to come up here and I'm going to take a look at each of these little waveforms, okay? Each of these little waveforms here. And notice that, you know, we've got almost um, one waveform per box, or even maybe more, maybe more than one waveform per box. But if we say one waveform, okay, or let's say one, two, three, three waveforms, um, about four waveforms per box, uh, four, let's, let me do this, one, two, one, two, three, let me find a different waveform here. Let me go here. I've got one, two, three. So about, uh, four, five. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, if I were to count the small boxes between each of these, we said they were what? They said between, we said between the ventricular um, between the R peaks, our ventricular rhythm was about 70, 78. We had approximately 19 small boxes, okay? Um, in this case, uh, we have many more waveforms. So when you're looking at the atrial rhythm, okay, the, the distance between the atrial rhythms uh, because we have so many more waveforms, is going to increase the heart rate dramatically when we look at the atrial heart rate. Okay, so the atrial heart rates it's going to be it's it's going to be crazy. We are going to have um, per uh, per one per one box. You know, we'll have say a distance of maybe one. So our heart rate here is probably about 250, um, roughly around 250 atrial rhythm. And that's not, um, that's not unusual to have a 250 rate atrial rhythm when you're looking at atrial flutter. That's what we're looking here. This is, that's what this is right here. This is atrial flutter. These are, these are called flutter waves. And you're wondering probably where I got the 250, right? So if we took our 1500 and we had divided it by 19 and we got 78, okay, then um, 19, 19, times 78 is approximately 1500, right? So if I have 250, okay, 
and I want to find out what the distance is between uh, in my atrial rhythm, what we can do is I would take, so I would take, so our, we said our heart rate for our atria was um, 250 beats per minute. So 1500 divided by X is 250 or 1500 divided by 250 is equal to X. So 250, so 1500, divided by 250 comes out to about six. So we're looking at between each particular um, uh, distance, only six, okay? What does that tell us? That tells us that this is extremely fast. That tells us that the conduction between the, a, the uh, SA node and the AV node is just is extremely, extremely rapid. Now, this is atrial fibrillation, okay? Or atrial flutter, rather. And atrial fibrillation kind of looks the same, um, and I'll show you the difference um, shortly. So in this particular case, all we could measure is the QRS. We really don't have, a, a, we don't have the ability to measure um, a P wave. We can't measure a PR. Uh, we really can't measure a QT. So in that case, you would say uh, atrial flutter, um, atrial rhythm approximately 250, ventricular rhythm 78. The ventricular rhythm is regularly regular. But we can measure, what we can measure is a QRS, okay? So let's go ahead and measure a QRS that we can measure. Okay, so let's do a QRS and let's move this down. And can you tell me by looking at this what our QRS is and whether our QRS is normal? In the chat box, can you tell me, uh, or if you're um, at home and you don't have the chat box and you're just maybe just listening, can you um, tell me what the measurement is for the QRS? Put it in the chat box. Yeah. So the QRS is two small boxes or 0 0.08, right? That's correct. 0 0.08. This is what we call atrial flutter. And, um, you know, atrial flutter is, is, is rather a transient rhythm. A flutter, we may have all experienced it in the past where you kind of feel like your breath is taken away, kind of feel like there's a butterfly in your chest. This is, I mean, it's not normal. This can occur through uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulation, too much uh, Red Bull, too many cups of coffee, not getting enough sleep. There's multiple reasons why the heart can go into a flutter. Uh, it is not a normal sinus rhythm, so it, you would have to notify your supervisor, your nurse, or the doctor you're working with. Uh, if this were to, you know, regardless, um, this is a six second strip, so you have to let them know. But usually this resolves itself, okay? A flutter. So let's continue to the next one. Does anyone have any questions on, um, on atrial flutter? All right. and, and what I was doing, uh, again, with the 250, I was counting about six, um, six little waveforms here. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next one. All right, we're going to look at this one right now. Uh, let me see what I have here. Okay, I'm going to uh, answer to everyone. I think Al Albert's question is, um, is uh, viable. Um, you, you mentioned, Albert, that it showed artifact. 
And while in fact, um, artifact, let me just go back up to this. While in fact, this, this could be artifact, I'm not gonna say it's not. Um, and, I, and I believe that when you take a look at this, um, I wanted to show you um, kind of what a flutter would look like. I think in a flutter or a fib, you won't have as many of these tiny little waveforms. So we can go with artifact um, because there are just a lot of waveforms in between here. The thing with artifact that kind of confounds me in some cases, and I will say, is that you're gonna you won't see regular R to Rs um, a lot of time in artifact. If the leads are not completely affixed to the patient's chest, yes, this can happen. This looks like a flutter too, although the flutter waves are not as condensed. So um, it's a, that's a good point, Albert. I would say that if we want to interpret this as artifact, as uh, it says in the literature, we'll go ahead and do that just because there are just too, too many waveforms in between the R peaks. And this usually occurs when the, um, uh, when the leads are off or they're not making, not off, but not making complete contact. Um, but also you'll see um, if the patient's moving in bed, the, the R waves are not as stable either. So good, good point. All right, let's take a look at this one. All right. And let's go here. All righty. So we're going to take apart this particular uh, waveform. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to inspect it, visually inspect this as you look at this waveform and see if there's anything unusual about it that may come to mind. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to measure our atrial rhythm. Okay, so let's go ahead and take our calipers. I don't know why this is happening, sorry. Right, let's take our calipers. And bring it up here and let's go ahead and measure our atrial rhythm, shall we? Which is our P to P. P to P. P to P. P to P, P to P, and P to P, okay? So that is our atrial rhythm. Now let's go ahead and look at our ventricular rhythm. I'm not gonna change the calipers because I wanna see if the ventricular rhythm is synchronous with the atrial rhythm. So I'm gonna go ahead and take, I don't know why that's happening. Sorry, I'm gonna, Take my calipers and go R to R, R to R, R to R, R to R, and R to R. So what we see is that the atrial rhythm is synchronous with the ventricular rhythm, which means that it's regularly regular, and we can go ahead and measure the heart rate. So let's go ahead and do that, shall we? Let's take it R to R and then let's line it up on a solid line. And I want to get it so it's almost complete. What do we have here? Okay. How we can actually use the big box rule because we actually have the, you know, almost even with respect to big boxes. Can you type in the chat box or write down if you're at home and tell me what the, um, what the rate is? Okay, what's the rate? Okay, good. Very good. Very good. So if we say we have four big boxes and we do the 300 rule, which is fine with this, and we have four big boxes, 300 divided by four is 75, right? Four big boxes is four times five, right, is 20, and 1,500 divided by 20 is also 75, so perfect. So for those of you that said 75, good show, good job. 
So we know the heart rate is, is within normal range. We have a sinus rhythm that is giving us um, P waves for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave. We also have um, a regularly regular rhythm. So now what we're left is with is our measurements for the QRS, the QT, and the PR. So let's start with our QRS. Let's line it up, Q. QRS, and let me line this up on a solid line. So what do you see our QRS to be about? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. What you think the QRS is? Good job. 0 0.08, right? Two small boxes, 0 0.04 and 0 0.04 is 0 0.08, good job. So our QRS, we'd write that down as 0 0.08. Let's do our PR, shall we? So let me take this up to do a PR, P, R, oh, right here. I'm gonna line this up. Now, Go ahead and type in the chat box what you think the PR interval is. Remember, the PR interval can be between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20, right? So what is the PR? Go ahead and type it in the chat box or write it down. What is the PR? What do you get? Good job. I'm seeing 0 0.16. Yes, yes, yes. Some of you are getting this. I'm hoping all of you are getting this, actually, um, because this is not easy stuff. Okay, it's not. It's not easy stuff at all. If you're getting this, good job. Um, yes, so the PR is 0 0.16, which, again, falls into normal. So we're getting closer and closer to making our diagnosis of a normal sinus rhythm, right? Now, last one is QT. Let's go ahead and take this to the Q. Now remember, to the T, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna move this to the T. Right there. Okay, right there. I'm gonna line this up. And What is the measurement for the QT interval? And remember the QT interval is between 0, 0.0 is between 0 0.34 and 0 0.44. So if you don't mind, put it in the chat box or write it down and we'll see what we have. What do you have for the QT interval? Very good. Okay. So we're within the normal range. What do we have? We have almost two boxes, two, two large boxes, right? So two large boxes would give us what? 0 0.40, right? But if we had, um, so that would be um, um, 10, but we don't have 10. We have nine small boxes and nine times 0 0.04. Four is 36, and everybody, I think, answered between 36 and 38. Okay, got a point seventy-six. No. Remember, each of these small little tiny boxes is 0 0.04, right? So if I add up 0 .0, 0 0.04 five times, I get 0 0.20. So one whole box going this way is 0 0.20. Another whole box going this way is 0 0.20. 0.2 and 0 0.2 is 0 0.4, but it's not, not 0.4 exactly, right? It's a little bit less than 0.4. It's actually 0.4 minus 0 0.04, which gives us 0.36, which is our answer. So if we had to 
look at this. Don't look at this down here. That's the next rhythm. This would be a normal sinus rhythm, right? Detectives, yes, my heart detectives out there. This would be a normal sinus rhythm. And how would you, um, so how would you verify this, right? You would say, you would write down all of the, um, the factors that led you to interpret this as a normal sinus rhythm. Heart rate, less between 60 and 100, right? What did we say, 78, something like that? Uh, normal QRS, normal QT, normal PR, right? We said the atrial rate and the ventricular rate were synchronous. So all those things indicate that we have a normal sinus rhythm. Very good. Very, very good. Now let's go to the next one, shall we? Okay, let's take a look at this. Now, obviously, you should be wondering now, okay, this doesn't look normal, right? The first thing that you're probably looking at is maybe the space between each of the R peaks seems a little bit too wide. So I would ask you, from what you've learned so far, is um, without even doing any kind of measuring, what do you think the heart's doing? So we have a lub dub, and then we have a lub dub, right? What does that mean? Okay, put it in the chat box. What do you think's happening here? What do you think's happening? Okay, resting too long, good. Um, so let's see just about how long this is. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our atrial and our ventricular rhythms. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take it, we're gonna go from the P and all the way to the P. Whew, that's a long way. And we're gonna go here and we're gonna move it to the next one. All right, this is our P to P. Let's go ahead and measure that, shall we? I'm gonna line this up and line this up. What is the heart rate? What is the heart rate? Go ahead and take a minute. And tell me what you get with this particular heart rate. We've got some answers here. Let me take a look what we got. Let's see what some of you came up with. Yes, yes. This is a very long heart rate. We're getting 38 to 39. Oh my God. Now I'm going to ask you, we're going to measure the ventricular rate. And then I'm going to ask you another question and see what you come up with. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. R to R, R to R. So the ventricular rate and the atrial rate are the same. So here's a question to all of you right now. If we have a heart rate of 38, what is, okay, we do see that this, we have a sign, we, we, we have a P wave, so we have a sinus rhythm. But what node would be implicated in the absence of a P wave, okay, that would give us 38 beats per minute? What is the node that beats between 20 and 40? Go ahead in the chat box. What is the node? What is the node that beats between 20 and 40. 20 and 40, everybody. Yes. The bundle of his, right? The bundle of his beats between 20 and 40. Now, if you're a medical assistant and you're working in a cardiology office, you may have to do this, okay? It may not just, look, if you've got somebody on a treadmill, okay, they're not going to make it if they've got this rhythm 
And if you are a telemetry technician, you're monitoring this from a remote location. So normally when we sleep, our heart rates don't usually go down to 38. I mean, it could be like an amazing athlete. You might be like the athlete and that might even be normal while you sleep, okay? I'm not saying it's not because we've got a P wave, we've got a QRS, uh, we can do the measurements. But if you have someone on a telemetry monitor that is in a bed, and you're seeing this, this is not normal. If this starts dropping, we are there going to become hypoxic, okay? And hypoxia means that the heart is going to be starved, the body is going to be starved with oxygen. Let's think of it physiologically, everyone. The body is going to be starved with oxygen, therefore the pH is going to go down. The body's plasma is going to become more and more acidic since more CO2 is building up. And as more and more CO2 builds up and we have more acidosis, okay, that's going to cause um, more problems, okay? So this, this person may have periods of apnea where they have, maybe they have sleep apnea and this is happening with, because they don't have a CPAP or a BiPAP. There, there could be multiple reasons. But because this person is actually on a monitor, we have to think about what are the physiological repercussions of having a heart rate of only 38 beats per minute. I mean, if you're taking somebody's pulse and it's 38 beats per minute, okay, and they're lying in a bed, they're going to be pretty tired, okay? I mean, I've seen people on digoxin with heart rates in the 40s, but when you start dropping below 40, we start to have some real physiological signs and symptoms that are going to manifest themselves in addition to this. Okay, so it's not just about, you know, can we look at the heart rate? No, I want you to do more than that. I want you to think about it from a physiological and disease standpoint. What's going to happen to somebody that has a heart rate of 38 beats per minute? Well, now that we've configured and we've agreed um, on the heart rate and we said it's below 60, which means this is bradycardia, this is profound bradycardia. It's sinus bradycardia because we have a P wave, right? Um, the rhythm is regular. I mean, with respect to the, um, the atrial and ventricular rhythms being synchronous with one another. So let's go ahead and measure some of the other um, parameters, okay? So let's start with the QRS. All right. And we'll go ahead and put this together with the QRS, I'll bring this down here. What is the QRS? Go ahead and type that in the chat box. What do you think the QRS measurement is? Normal, abnormal, what's the measurement? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. Okay, good. Point 0.8, or point zero 0.08, I'm sorry. Some of you said point 0.8, it should be point zero 0.08, right? Yeah. There you go. All right, so is that normal? Yes, QRS is normal. What does that mean, the QRS? Uh, Jace, it says it's, it's normal because that is where the AV node is going to send its electrical stimulation to the bundle of his, which is going to send the, the other electrical, um, um, the, the other electrons through the bundle branches. And when it gets to the bundle branches, um, it's gonna send it to the Purkinje fibers. So now let's take a look at, we've got a normal QRS, all right? Now let's go and measure um, the PR, all right? So let's go to the PR, P, R. All right, I'm gonna bring this down. I want you to take a look at this. Tell me what the PR interval is. Remember, the PR interval can be between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20. What is the PR? Type it in the chat box. Okay, yes. Almost 0.2, almost 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 shy. 
So 0 0.16 would be correct. Is that normal? Yes. So our QRS is normal. Our PR interval is normal. Let's take a look at our QT. Q. T. Uh, bring this down. All right, what's our QT? Remember, QT can be between 0 0.34 and 0 0.44. So if you're looking at these little boxes, what do you see as far as the QT interval? About one shy of 0 0.20, right? Or 0 0.40, so 0.36, would we agree? I mean, you know, if, if you were um, looking at this and you said 0.4, you know, um, point, actually 0.36 would be, right? Remember, we've got two boxes here, everybody. Two boxes. Almost two boxes. Every one large box is 0.20. So everything seems to be okay except the resting phase, right, between where... The heart is um, repolarized. So this repolarization phase is taking way too long. We have a normal heartbeat, though. Everything within it is normal. The only thing abnormal here is a really slow heart rate. Now, if this was 55, if this was even 54, from a stamp, physiological standpoint of somebody in good physical condition, this might be a normal for them. In any other condition, this would have to be reported because eventually if the heart rate keeps dropping and we, still, we keep getting this longer and longer interval between the R peaks, this person is gonna be in profound hypoxia and these are not gonna be normal anymore, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this has to be reported regardless of the fact that we got a normal QRS uh, a normal QT, normal PR. All right, we've got a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave. It's not normal. Now, in the when we look at this, okay, and we're asked, we need to ask ourselves, why is this taking so long to repolarize? Okay, and a lot of that has to do with the potassium influx. Um, into um, into the heart muscle. So, you know, it could just very well be that it's, uh, there's a conduction problem with, um, with uh, potassium. Okay, so that's a different uh, lecture. All righty, so let's go on here. Something interesting, all right. Um, let's take a look at this one. Now we're, we're, we're looking at this rhythm and uh, if you take a look at it, what's different between this rhythm and the rhythm that we just looked at previously with regard to rate? What would you say, just off the cuff? And go ahead and share, um, if you will, in the chat box. Yeah, this, this rate looks a bit faster, right? So you have to get used to inspecting rhythms. Yes, I would definitely say this rhythm looks a little bit faster. If we take a look at it, we've got a P wave, QRST, P, QRST. So it looks to be that there's a uh, P wave for every um, QRS and a QRS for every P wave. Now let's go ahead and measure um, the atrial rhythm and let's compare the atrial rhythm to the ventricular rhythm. Ideally, we want both rhythms to be what? Synchronous, right? So, um, Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go from P to P. 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 Oh. Well, that's not working there, right? Notice this one. This is not normal here. I'm trying to go P to P, but it's not there. Okay. Now let's do R to R. R to R. R to R. R to R. Yep. 
Looking good? Looking good? Looking good? Nope. A little bit different there. Kind of out of synchronicity. But for the most part, they're normal. Okay? So we're going to take it right now and not worry about this guy just at the moment. Okay? Uh, but we're going to take a look at this. And right now we're going to say, well, for the most part, the atrial rhythm and the ventricular rhythm are synchronous. Now we can go ahead and calculate the heart rate. So I'm going to line this guy up right here and I'm going to ask you to use a chat box or a pen or pencil and take a minute to see if you can calculate the heart rate okay so take a second to do that type it in the chat box and tell me what you get for the heart rate I'm getting some answers here Okay, I'm getting about 120, which would be close. I'm coming up with um, 115 because I'm counting 5, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I'm going with 13. So whether you go with 13 and 14, 115 to 120, not bad. Um, you could even say 3.5 boxes. So 300 divided by 3.5. No, that's not right. 2.5, I'm sorry, 300 divided by 2.5 boxes is about 120. So yes, so between 115 and 120 is the heart rate. And let's see what else we have, who else might have answered. Yep, okay, good job. Now, what does that tell us? What did we say? We said a normal rhythm, our number of heart rate is between 60 and 100. Less than 60 is bradycardia, greater than 100 is called tachycardia, right? So um, because we have a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave, we can say that this is sinus tachycardia with a heart rate of approximately 115 to 120, depending on you know, what you came up with. Um, let's go ahead and measure our QRS. All right, so we're gonna take this and we're gonna measure our QRS. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this right here. All right, this is a this is this is kind of a rough one because you know we don't really have the um the wherewithal to have the point of accuracy that we can actually take a half of a very small box, which is 0 0.04, right? But go ahead and put in the uh, chat box what you came up with. What do you think the QRS is? Okay, good. Good, 0 0.06, even if you said 0 0.08, if you're busy and you're looking at this, brilliant, okay? Very good, so your QRS is, um, is still within normal range. I mean, some hospitals will go to 0 0.06, some will say 0 0.08 is the cutoff. So we're gonna go ahead with 0 0.06 um, or 0 0.08, we're gonna say it's normal. Let's go ahead and we're gonna do the, um, PR, P, PR, oops, sorry, so I'm going to pull this down here, and what are we getting for the PR? What are you getting for the PR? How many boxes do we have here? One, two, three, about four. So the PR, um, what are you guys getting? What are we all getting here for the PR? About four boxes, 0.16, yeah, PR is 0.16, and it can be between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20. Um, very good, 
Could be a little less than that. One, two, three. Yeah. So, so between um, 0 0.12 and 0 0.16, roughly, but it's still within the normal range. The PR, the QRS. Let's take a look at the QT, which we said is, right, which we said could be between, sorry, I need to move my calipers. QT, Q. T. All right, here's our QT. All right, what can you tell me about, is that right? Let me just double check on this again, guys, QT. All right, yep, yeah, it's right. Okay, what's the QT interval? What's our QT interval? What about seven, seven small boxes? All right, let me take a look at what we have here. Oh, I've got some, okay, QT, 0 0.27, 0 0.24, 0 0.28. Yeah, I'm getting 0.28. Yeah, 0 0.24, 0 0.28. What's the normal QT? The normal QT is between 0 0.34, right? and 0 0.44. So what can we say about the QT interval? I mean, it's not normal. And that is what you're going to find. The faster the heart rate goes, okay, the more compressed your measurements are gonna become. Not so much, I mean, our QRS is beginning to start to show it. Um, our PR hasn't really been affected by it too much, but the QT, absolutely we are way below normal, okay? We're at 0 0.28, 0 0.26, 0 0.34 is normal. So two things are abnormal with this rhythm, right? Number one, the heart rate, which we said is about 120. Number two, the QT interval, which we said is about 0 0.28. Um, and then we start running into some abnormalities out here. So this would be, this would be sinus tachycardia, and we would have an abnormal so sinus tachycardia with a heart rate of 120 and a QT of 0 0.28. Okay, that's how you would have to read that. Now, if any of us were on a treadmill, we know that we can get our heart rates up to 156, 160, maybe 175. But once you start getting into faster and faster heart rates, can you tell me what, what is the, uh, the problem that the heart is going to have, the faster the heart rate becomes. Think about what we said in the beginning, about what the heart has to do in between beats. And what and answer me in the chat box and tell me what you think the heart rate's going to have, the heart's going to have trouble doing as the heart rate becomes more and more. Faster and faster, I should say. Okay, okay, yep, one answer is getting oxygen, yes. And the reason, okay, it's not going to be able to get as much oxygen is because it doesn't have time to rest. No, notice, if you had to find the isoelectric line here, eh, maybe this, I mean, this is like a, not even a rest, right? So there's not even a, a barely a rest here at 120. So if the heart rate were to continue at 120 nonstop for too long, the heart would start, this would start, this rhythm would start deteriorating and the heart would, um, as, as um, Albert was saying, would become starved with oxygen, in which case we would, we would have an issue, okay? Now, I mean, 120 is not, is not abnormal to the point in our daily lives that we don't get our heart rate up there. But it's transient, right? It's transient. It doesn't, we don't stay at 120, 24 seven, okay? So uh, you need to think about these things. Um, what happens if, okay? Why is this bad? Because there's no resting. There's really not a lot of time to rest in between heart rates. Okay, this is a little bit better, okay? 
this is a little bit better in the sense that this is atrial, um, this is atrial flutter. And how I diagnose this between atrial fibrillation, because atrial flutter is here, guys. The top one is, the top answer is to the bottom rhythm. Okay. All right, so if you take a look at this, these are the sawtooth pattern that you see here, as opposed to the artifact um, that was pointed out earlier. This looks a little bit more even, right? I mean, the distance between, um, you, you see that each of these little key waves, or these are called flutter waves, you really can't, um, you have what we call a ventricular rhythm here, whereas you have uh, an atrial rhythm here. And basically, um, the atrial rhythm, and I would count five boxes in between the R and the P. Is between 250 and 300. Okay. Um, so you really can't count these as P waves, even though that's kind of what they are, but they're flutter waves. Um, we can calculate. Um, so here it's very important to understand that we have what we call a ventricular rhythm and we have an atrial rhythm. Now the atrial rhythm here is actually reg regular, but it's extremely extraordinarily fast. Whereas the, um, whereas the ventricular rhythm, I'm supposing is probably normal. Let's go from here to here and see. All right, let's go ahead and count our ventricular rhythm. Okay, and what do we have? What is, what is the heart rate? What is the ventricular heart rate? Can you tell me? What do we have? Go ahead and share in the chat box. Tell me what you have for the ventricular rate. Yep, 75. So the 75 is our ventricular rate. If you got it, great. So let's just go ahead and measure this and see if it's the same. Ventricular rate is regular. Ventricular rate is regular. Okay, so the ventricular rate is regular, but the atrial rate is extremely, extraordinarily fast. Extraordinarily fast. Um, and, you know, you could even say if you've got, if you count four boxes in between, each of these, you would count four goes into 1500. So 1500 divided by four gives you 375. That's why they say between 350 and 400. That's how I calculate the rate. That's why it was almost impossible to calc calculate the rate with artifact because there were just too darn many um, little squiggles, um, which actually made it artifact. But I thought I could impress you with a very impressive atrial rhythm. But this is much, much more um, logical. So your atrial rhythm is definitely um, juxtaposed to your ventricular rhythm, completely different, right? But there's some form of regularity. And that is what you see with a flutter, some form of regularity. Whereas if you go to, um, if you go to atrial fibrillation, let's go to atrial fib. There you go. This is a little bit more like it. This is AFib. Okay, this almost looks like artifact, except they're not all squished, okay? Um, you'll notice one thing in, in um, atrial fibrillation that usually I always call attention to is that if you look at your ventricular rate, it's not normal. Your ventricular rate is not normal. It's variable across the board, okay? So there is not a, um, the, the ventricular rate is irregularly irregular, as well as the atrial rate is irregularly irregular. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it seems to be all over the place, exactly. Um, I would just like to say a few things about this rhythm before we close for the day, and I wanna thank you again all of you uh, for coming. Um, 
atrial fibrillation is widely implicated as a risk factor for stroke. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you why, because this, this can go on for long periods of time. Um, some people will actually need pacemakers to correct this, or they will need anti-dysrhythmic medication. The problem with atrial fibrillation is that the blood remains uh, stasis in the ventricles for too long and it doesn't circulate properly, which can cause a thrombosis. Um, that thrombosis uh, can break off from the um, interior walls of the, uh, <clears throat> of the endocardium and can move, and it can cause a um, pulmonary embolism uh, if it's in the right uh, ventricle, or it, it can cause a cerebral vascular accident uh, in the left ventricle. So these people that have, um, you know, persistent atrial uh, fibrillation, uh, they have to remain on blood thinners such as Coumadin and or low molecular weight heparin to uh, prevent uh, thromboses from occurring. So with that, I am going to thank everybody. Um, I hope you all stay safe out there. If you have any questions, uh, please email me, let me know. Um, and uh, we will have lecture again on um, Monday. And I have one question. Uh, yes, I am. Actually, uh, thank you. Uh, this lecture will be going up on the website. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say good night and good afternoon to everybody. Study hard. We'll keep meeting, keep, keep uh, getting together so that, um, you know, Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so that when we can get back to school, hopefully by next uh, what, end of April, we can get back to normal and uh, hopefully everyone's lives will go back to normal too. Okay. So thank you um, and stay safe. Good night.